I'm going to ask everyone to please find a seat. We'll get the program started in just a moment. If everyone could please find a seat. There are plenty of seats over on the right hand side. If you're looking for one, we'll start in just a moment. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Miko, the executive director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's been a great privilege to welcome you to tonight's library hour. As you all know, the Union League Legacy Foundation is a nonprofit a charity, charity that's affiliated with the Union League of Philadelphia. We use the spirit, the values of this great institution, the Union League of Philadelphia, for all kinds of programs throughout the year. You've heard me talk a lot about civics education as part of those programs. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about that in the months to come. We've made a strategic decision that that's where we can make the biggest difference and where we need to make uh, the biggest difference. And all that we do is made possible through your generosity. So for all of you that have made a contribution, I thank you. Uh, for those of you that didn't, I look forward to your, uh, to your gift. And uh, I ask you to please see my friend, Gary Dorsheimer, who is the chair of our development committee. And I thank Gary for all of his great work on behalf of the Legacy Foundation. Gary, thank you. Thank you. So tonight, um, of course, today is 9-11. So today I'd, I'd ask you to remember 9-11, remember those that we lost, of course, in 9-11, but also remember why we lost them. We lost them because America is still the land of hope. And that land of hope is still under attack from those that don't share the values of the Union League or the values um, of our country, that they don't share those laws and those great that great declaration um, uh, it, that all men are created equal. They don't share those values that we do. That's why we were attacked. Um, and so remember not just those that we lost, but take a moment with me now and just remember why we lost them and remember that we must remain vigilant, excuse me. Thank you. So a few housekeeping items. Uh, tonight, the program will be about an hour long. We do have hopefully time for Q&A. We will have the Q&A through the microphone. We are streaming uh, or recording, I should say. So please use the microphone so that um, we can uh, all hear your, your questions. We'll get to as many questions as possible. Now, I've said this almost every time. The one time I didn't say it back in May, we had a problem. A question should be a couple of sentences, three or four. It's not a speech. And you gotta be able to put a question mark on the end of that sentence, that last one. That's a question. So please, please help me out there if you would. And now it's my, my great pleasure to introduce the man who will introduce our speaker tonight, the chair of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Jim Dunnigan. Jim. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening's library hour, James B. Conroy. <clears throat> 
is a graduate of the University of Connecticut, George Washington University, and Georgetown University with degrees in law and international relations. Conroy's diverse academic background is only superseded by his professional career, which includes stints as a speechwriter on Capitol Hill, as a journalist in the Naval Reserve, in politics, and as a lawyer in a leading national litigation firm. However, it is Conroy's most recent vocation that of historian that brings him here tonight. His first book, One Common Country, Abraham Lincoln and the Hampton Roads Peace Conference of 1865 was a finalist for the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize in 2014. His second book, Lincoln's White House, The People's House in Wartime was a co-winner of the Lincoln Prize and won the Abraham Lincoln Institute's annual book award. His third book, Jefferson's White House, Monticello on the Potomac received national acclaim from both scholars and historians. His most recent book, The Devils Will Get No Rest, FDR, Churchill, and the plan that won the war is the subject of tonight's talk. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back to the Union League, James B. Conroy. Well, thank you, Jim, for that kind introduction, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I have been to, I don't know, a dozen private clubs around the country on book tours, and I must say this is the most impressive of them all. It's really quite spectacular, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, the book, The Devil's Will Get No Rest, uh, concerns what's called the Casablanca Conference of 1943. Uh, in, held in January of 1943 in Morocco. Um, and uh, the essence of it is a conclave consisting of Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and their entire combined high command, all in one place for 10 days, surrounded by barbed wire in a war zone. Uh, when I heard about that, I thought there's gotta be a story there somewhere. And uh, happily, it turned out that there was. Um, I, I always like to mention that the first time it, you know, came to me to do the book, or I shouldn't say it came to me, but when I had just signed the contract to do the book, uh, I had uh, lunch with a friend who knew about the prior three, which were about Lincoln and Jefferson, and uh, said, well, gee, that subject sounds like a very daunting thing to, to undertake. Um, until then, I haven't thought of it as daunting. Uh, since then, I could think of it as nothing but daunting. Uh, which in fact uh, turned out to be. But uh, Jim was kind enough to mention Lincoln's White House. And although uh, Oprah has not yet endorsed the book, it does have a, it does have a bit of a celebrity following. Uh, as you can see. Um, I don't have the book signed by the president, but he does wish me well and has asked me to convey that. It's a, uh, so let's start with the um, the stars of the show, if you will. This photograph was taken uh, at the conference. Of course, FDR uh, seated on the left and Churchill on the right. And behind them, respectively, are the three Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States and the three senior officers of the British High Command. And we'll talk about uh, each of them as we go. Um, the, I think the first thing to talk about when we approach this subject is the very delicate relationship between the British and the Americans at this point in history. Um, there had been, after all, uh, two wars fought between the United States and Great Britain. And although 1943 is not that terribly far away uh, from our own time, uh, they did, you know, the internet didn't exist, television didn't exist, Radio didn't go across the ocean. There was no in international air travel to speak of. And um, there were really two very distinct cultures and peoples that had, in some cases, uh, suspicious and dim opinions of each other collectively. Um, so the idea of them working together as allies uh, 
uh, in this crucial world war as they had in the first world war, but really in, for a much shorter period uh, and without anything like the cohesion that was achieved uh, in World War II. Uh, but I think the first thing to discuss very briefly is the perception that they had of each other. Um, the book is very character driven. It, you know, I, I've always said that anybody can look up how many landing craft were built in 1942 or, you know, who the commanding officers were of this army or that. But what really interested me and always has is the personalities of these players and how they interacted with each other. You know, what did they make of each other? How did they like each other, if at all? Um, how did these titanic egos, you know, you don't get to be in those positions and those uniforms with all those stars on your shoulders without being a very accomplished person with a bit of an ego. So you can imagine them all, you know, uh, wrestling uh, verbally with each other in this conference for those 10 days. And it was far from sweetness and light. Uh, on the British side, you're dealing with uh, a country that had been a global world power for 300 years. The Americans had only begun to be a world power and had in fact shied away from that role in the years between the wars and had very little uh, interaction with other countries to speak of. Uh, the military of the United States was ranked number 17 in the world when the, when the war began. Uh, by the time the war ended, uh, there were, I think it was, I mean, I, I won't say the number because I'm not good with numbers. That's why I went to law school. Uh, but um, it was a stupendous number that they had assembled and the, the production was, was unbelievable, the wartime uh, production. But the Americans were still pretty wet behind the ears when it came to international diplomacy and military strategy and that sort of thing. Uh, the British had been at it for three centuries. And they had also been fighting Hitler uh, since 1939. Uh, the Americans, of course, didn't come into the war until 1941, the end of 1941. And by the time this conference took place in January of 43, there was not a single American bullet had been fired in Europe. Not a single American bomb had dropped on Germany. This was a British war, basically fighting them alone with American help in Europe for those, for those years. Uh, the Americans, of course, were fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, but they had very little exposure thus far to the European war. Uh, the British, one British general writes about the Americans, and this I think is quite typical of the British view, uh, that they were friendliness itself, uh, hardworking, eager to please, uh, easy to work with, reliable, loyal, and very good at organizing which all I like to say could very well be said about a border collie. Uh, if you strip away the veneer of sort of polite condescension, which is what was coming across that conference table from the British most of this time, uh, what you have is a pretty dim view of their military capabilities, of their strategic abilities, uh, their depth as a world power, which in fact, as I've said, was very thin. On the other end of the, the table, the Americans uh, were well aware of all of that and didn't like it. Um, you can imagine the likes of George C. Marshall and his colleagues coming into that environment, you know, with that sort of vibe going on in, in these conference uh, sessions. And it was not a genial situation, certainly not at the beginning. Um, Marshall said after the war that we were always very suspicious of the British. They were not suspicious of us. They didn't think we were smart enough to be treacherous. So that sort of starts us off on uh, where this thing began. Um, did I go two slides with that or just one? Okay, just one. Uh, it's not showing up on my screen. The, um, the maps were created for the book and I think it's a good place to start to give us a sense of what the world situation was when this conference began in January of 43. And the one word that sums it up for me is terrifying. Uh, you can start with the right-hand side of the map with the Pacific theater. Uh, Japan is in black, uh, Japan proper, which included at the time Korea and Taiwan, which they had annexed early, earlier in the century. The gray area is the territory that the Japanese had conquered uh, in the uh, period between 1937 and uh, 1943. 
And as you can see, it's complete domination of the uh, of Western Asia or Eastern Asia and um, the Western Pacific. Uh, the American Navy had stopped the Japanese advance at the battles of Midway and Coral Sea in October, of, uh, rather in May and June of 1942, uh, sinking three J Japanese aircraft carriers and basically taking out their ability to, to continue an aggressive war of conquest. But they were still very powerful force, dug in very deeply in all of those captured territories and a long way from defeat. In Europe, you can see an even more disturbing picture there. Uh, in black is the German Reich and Italy, the two Axis powers in Europe. In dark gray are uh, the territories that the Germans had conquered and occupied and controlled. And the so-called neutral countries that you see scattered around there Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, Sweden, uh, Turkey were pro-German. They were neutral in, uh, you know, officially and legally, but in practice were supplying steel to the Germans, financial backing, all kinds of support to the Germans. So when this conference convenes in January of 1943, you look at that map of Europe, that's Hitler's domination over essentially all of Europe again, without an American bomb or bullet having yet been fired there. So this is a, a, a terrifying situation that, um, that the British and the Americans faced at that time. The only thing else I should mention at this point is if you look at the, look at the North African uh, map, uh, several months before the conference began in the fall of 1942, the Americans and British had combined to attack North Africa uh, with a huge amphibious assault and took everything between Morocco and Tunisia in the ensuing few days from the French. The French, after all, you know, were the empire that controlled North Africa. And without getting into it, we don't have time. The book, of course, does. But Vichy France, which has sort of been the, the, the rump government installed by the Germans after they defeated the French in 1940, were effectively a German ally. Uh, and the allies, that is the British and the Americans had hoped that the French would roll over. They would either not resist this invasion or give it only token resistance. But under orders from VC, they did give it resistance. Uh, about 1500 Americans died in those first couple of days and about an equal number of French. We don't hear that very much. Uh, we don't learn that I think in our schools, but um, this was the situation that prevailed at the time. So there was a very large British and American army in North Africa, ready to go somewhere next. And the decision to be made at Casablanca primarily was where they would go. What will we, we do next in this offensive stage of the war? Up to that time, the British had won the Battle of Britain, keeping the Germans out of Britain in 1940. That was a defensive battle, of course. They had lost every other battle that they fought with the Germans, who were easily the most powerful, uh, most ruthless, swiftest, best equipped, equipped best led uh, body of soldiers that the world had ever seen. This is a totally fearsome enemy that the British and the Americans faced in total command and control of Europe when this curtain goes up on this conference. Joseph Stalin was not at the conference. Uh, the Battle of Stalingrad was literally raging at the time the conference took place. And uh, although he was invited, uh, Stalin begged off because of his plate being rather full with the Battle of Stalingrad, but also because he was paranoid about the idea of leaving the Soviet Union, actually of leaving the Kremlin uh, for fear of assassination and uh, you know a coup and that sort of thing. So uh, Stalin stayed in Moscow uh, and was kept apprised of what was happening afterward, but was not in attendance there. If people wonder what happened to Stalin, he was, uh, he was fighting that crucial battle of Stalingrad at the time. Churchill, of course, uh, if anybody needs no introduction, I guess it's Winston Churchill. Uh, this I think is the most famous portrait that was ever taken of Churchill, uh, done in Ottawa in 1941. And there's a nice little story associated with that. There was a young Canadian photographer 
uh, who was asked to take the photograph. He set up his tripod and his camera. Churchill sat in his chair with a cigar in his hand and a big smile on his face, which is not the look that the photographer wanted. So the photographer quickly stepped from around his camera and snatched the guitar out of Churchill's hand, uh, the cigar out of Churchill's hand and came back behind the camera and got the look that he wanted um, for that famous photograph of Churchill. Uh, Churchill, it should be known, is or was a very uh, astute student of military history and military strategy, steeped in it from a very young age. He had graduated from Sandhurst, the West Point of Great Britain, served in three wars, uh, had written 24 books of military history, the first of which he had produced in 1890, uh, and was completely steeped uh, in military strategy as First Lord of the Admiralty during World War I, as Secretary of State for War during World War I. Between the wars, he kept apprised of everything. And of course, he'd been directing the British military effort uh, personally and very actively on hand uh, for uh, the duration of, uh, of most of the war. So you've got in Winston Churchill, not only a great statesman, a great political figure, courageous leader, but a true military expert who knew what he was talking about when it came to uh, military strategy and had very strong opinions as he did about everything else. Franklin Roosevelt was of a different cut. Uh, he had never served in the military and had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy in World War I for eight years. And in that capacity, he learned a great deal about the Navy and uh, became fascinated by it. Uh, in fact, later on uh, in, in uh, debates between George Marshall at the head of the Army and the chiefs of the US Navy in the Oval Office, uh, Marshall at one point said to, to, to Roosevelt, Mr. President, I'd appreciate it if you stopped referring to the Navy as us and the Army as them. Uh, but that said, uh, Roosevelt was not terribly well versed in the intricacies of military strategy. He saw the big picture, he kept in touch with it, he understood it, uh, but he largely deferred the military decisions uh, to his high command. Uh, the idea for the conference, though, was, was FDRs. Uh, after the Anglo-American army took North Africa and that decision now had to be made of where do we go from here, uh, Roosevelt thought it made sense and was in fact crucial to have he and Churchill sitting at the same table and also to have their military high command meeting separately so they could look face to face and really grapple with what they needed to grapple with and also have the very senior leaders of the Anglo-American military nearby in North Africa or in London uh, to be able to come into that meeting and participate and share their expertise. So that was uh, why the meeting took place in Casablanca. Of course, it was very secret situation. You can imagine the target that uh, made itself available to the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, when you have Churchill, FDR, their high command in the same place for 10 days within range of German bombers. In fact, the Germans had bombed Casablanca two weeks before the conference began. So it's really quite a daring thing that they pulled off. Um, no one knew that anybody was going or where they were going when they were absent. Uh, the night before uh, New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, uh, FDR and Roosevelt had a little private party at the White House and showed a film after the party, typical FDR planting a joke that could not even be appreciated for weeks to come. Um, Humphrey Bogart uh, and Ingrid Bergman had just uh, come out on the silver screen uh, like the day before Churchill and, uh, and Roosevelt left for Casablanca. So it made for an interesting coincidence. So I'll go through each of the major players here, which again, the book is a personality uh, driven, character driven book. And I think it's important to understand the essence of who these people were. Uh, George C. Marshall, the chief of staff of the United States Army at the time, took command of a room by walking into it. I think if you just look at that face, you can see uh, visually the character of George C. Marshall. 
uh, a completely forbidding, dominating figure. Um, the uh, the uh, future Secretary of State himself for Truman, Marshall, but uh, one of his colleagues in that role preceding him, Dean Acheson, uh, once said, and Dean was no shrinking violet himself, but Dean Acheson said that Marshall's very personality was a striking and communicated force, that he would just come into a room and draw everybody to him immediately and kind of command that situation. So that's essentially the, the kind of personality and character that Marshall had. He was a veteran of World War I, uh, had served in France in very important staff positions, and had begun to build the American army to what it would later be, but of course, which it had not yet become. Well, one of his aides, his senior subordinates, later wrote after the war that no one ever came close to familiarity with George Caitlin Marshall. Uh, that said, there's a little contrast, I think, that makes for a quick, cute story. Um, Marshall was out riding, driving with his wife one Sunday in civilian clothes uh, in the countryside around Northern Virginia and uh, pulled into a gas station at which there were two young American soldiers talking to two young girls at the gas pump. They had already filled the tank and they were just standing there leaning on the gas pump talking to these girls. So Marshall just kind of taps the horn you know, to ask them to move along. One of the soldiers turns around and says, keep your shirt on, Pop. So Marshall's uh, widow told the story after the war and, and was asked, well, what did he do? He said he kept his shirt on. <laughs> uh, this, I think, gives you the contrast of Marshall's personality with Eisenhower's. Eisenhower was a Marshall protege, and at the time of the conference was the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe which wasn't saying much because there weren't many Americans in Europe, but uh, he was gonna be as it came on. This is a picture that was taken when they toured an American base in England. And you can see Ike running for, for mayor over there on the left. And uh, Marshall looks like his dog just died. So that's the, uh, that gives you a sense of George Marshall. Uh, the uh, CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations for the United States Navy, uh, Admiral Ernest J. King, uh, was both a blessing and a curse for the American Navy throughout the, world, the Second World War. From the time it began, in fact, before it began, right through the end, uh, King was in charge of the U.S. Navy. Uh, and on the one hand, there was no more brilliant naval strategist than Ernest King. He really uh, did wonders in that Pacific War. Uh, everybody you know, who knows what they're talking about credits him with true military genius, strategic genius as a naval commander. Uh, it was only as a human being that Ernie fell short. Um, he was easily the most despised senior officer in, in the American military, uh, arrogant, petty beyond belief. Uh, I call him in the book, a, a schoolyard punk in a Brooks Brothers uniform, which is what he was. Uh, at one point, uh, Eisenhower, who was then only a brigadier general, uh, writes in his diary, uh, one of the best ways to win this war might be to get somebody to shoot King. So that's what you're dealing with, with Ernest King. Uh, in his uh, treatise that he wrote at the Naval War College, uh, the thesis was in large part that democracy was a weakness and that the United States would probably be at war with Britain in the next few years as a rival naval power. And the third thing he said off the record, but often said, was that ideally in an ideal world, civilians would be told nothing about the war until it was over and then only who had won. The third big American figure at the table is, is uh, General Henry Arnold, known as Hap Arnold. And again, you look at the face and you see where that comes from. Um, a, a very gregarious, affable, but very demanding officer who had built the American Air Force from almost nothing really into one of the great air forces in the world, even at the time the war began. Uh, he, the, the Air Force was not a separate service at the time. It was under the uh, umbrella of the army, but it was Marshall that gave him the uh, responsibilities and you know, authority that a fellow chief of staff would have. So uh, he became and was a very important player uh, on the American side. He was not the brightest guy who ever came out of West Point um, and is known to have been uh, 
a little slow on the uptake. But as one of the uh, British generals said of him, you know, Arnold never paid any attention at the conference table to anything but it, the air. Uh, and he didn't have a whole lot to contribute otherwise. And no one really listened very carefully to what he had to say in that regard. Uh, but uh, Arnold's only focus, his only concern was to bomb the, ger the Germans every hour of every day, every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year from all corners of the globe. So that gives you a good sense of, of Hap Arnold. This is Hap uh, in 1913, I think it was, uh, in one of these bicycles with wheels that um, uh, made up the American Air Force at the time. If, if anybody ever challenged his credentials as a pioneer military aviator, he had a drop dead line. The Wright brothers had taught him to fly. Um, and of the 24 original American pilots that were brought into the Air Corps, 18 died in crashed airplanes uh, within that first year. It was, you just have to look at that equipment and think of what it would be like to go up in, in one of those things. Okay, to the British side now, uh, the chief of the Imperial General Staff, the senior most officer in the British Army, staff officer, uh, was uh, General Alan Brook, um, a, um, uh, the youngest son of an Anglo-Irish baronet uh, from a family of officers and general officers who had bled for the crown, as I say in the book, uh, for centuries since the English Civil War on the monarchy side. Um, so you've got sort of in the flesh, the personification of this three centuries of British imperial uh, majesty. He was by no means an armchair general. He was a great strategist, was respected around the world uh, as a brilliant military strategist, but had also fought in horrific conditions in World War I and had actually led the British army out of Dunkirk in 1940. Everybody knows, I guess, about the what they call the Mosquito Armada, Armada, Churchill called it the Mosquito Armada, that uh, came to rescue the British Army on the on the sands of Dunkirk, fishing boats, yachts, merchant ships, you know, military vessels. Uh, everybody knows that, but nobody thinks much about how that British Army got from the middle of France to Dunkirk, surrounded by the Germans, completely cut off from any assistance of any kind, with a little narrow corridor leading from where they were along the Belgian border to Dunkirk and had to fight their way for 40 miles through that, uh, through that, uh, that uh, cauldron, as he called it, uh, to get those survivors to Dunkirk. Brooke led that operation. And had it not been for that, the odds are very high there would not have been anything but a total German victory in World War II. The, everybody expected the Germans to cross the channel uh, very soon after they took France and uh, would have done so had it not been for that. Uh, Brooke was uh, a brilliant guy, not easy to deal with, uh, short-tempered, cantankerous, stubborn, uh, obstinate. The Americans were not fond of him personally with that kind of approach to things, uh, but respected him highly. And he formed a special relationship with Marshall that we'll talk about as we go. There was another side to Brooke. This is a sketch that he made for his children. Um, he wrote beautifully illustrated letters to his mother. He was a renowned bird photographer, one of the pioneer bird photographers, well-regarded ornithologist, a nature lover. And uh, when he had the time and the opportunity, even uh, in France uh, before the fighting at Dunkirk, he would take his sketchbook and his camera into the woods and come back with some really beautiful work. So again, we all have different sides and Brooks certainly had his. This is a photograph that was taken of Brooke with Churchill. Churchill had a cantankerous relationship with Brooke is the best way to describe it. The British Chiefs of Staff met with Churchill every day, sometimes twice a day, except Sunday. And uh, they would not be sort of gentlemanly discussions or rubber stamps. They would be pitched battles between Churchill and 
his military high command about what was possible, what was not possible, whether it could be done tomorrow or yesterday, uh, terribly demanding, uh, difficult, aggressive guy to work for, and Brooke was his match. So the two of them together made for quite the pair. At one point, um, Brooke and uh, Churchill, right after Brooke was appointed to be uh, chief of the Imperial General Staff, the two of them were invited to a country house, uh, the hostess for which wrote in her diary, uh, I don't know how General Brooke is going to get along with Winston because they were sitting on a sofa all afternoon and Brooke just seemed to be saying all the time, no, no, sir, you can't. This photograph was taken after, right after the invasion of France uh, at which, uh, well, at this time, Churchill insisted on going with Brooke on a British destroyer off the coast of France that was shelling German positions so that he could be in the thick of things. That aside, he had insisted on actually participating in the invasion of France in the lead British vessel coming into the beaches, could not be talked out of it by anyone except the king. He got a letter from the king's secretary one afternoon that said uh, his majesty's anxieties on D-Day could only be increased if he knew that his prime minister was at the bottom of the English Channel, um, which apparently managed to dissuade him, but uh, otherwise he'd have been there. The First Lord of the Admiralty at the time, uh, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, uh, was the son of uh, a British barrister and an American mother uh, from uh, a, a long line of Massachusetts seafarers. He joined the Royal Navy in 1890 at the age of 13, uh, spent his entire life with the Royal Navy, about which he was said to express very positive opinions. Um, he spoke at the conference really only about naval issues, but knew them in and out and had actually been in every major port in the world several times. No one had the depth and the naval experience and expertise that Dudley Brown brought, uh, Dudley Pound brought to the table. Whoops, wrong way. Uh, the chief, the commander of the Royal Air Force um, was uh, a British aristocrat of the true stripe, um, General Charles Portal. Uh, he had attended Winchester and Oxford, uh, came from a very wealthy, uh, semi-noble family, uh, had that kind of background and credentials, had joined the Royal, uh, rather the British Army, uh, on the third day of World War I as a humble motorcycle dispatch rider and then blown through, the do through a door by a shell that killed three men. Uh, within the first couple of days uh, of his service. Uh, when he joined the newly formed British Air Force in World War I, he spent most of that time in a biplane, flying the biplane and shooting at German pilots with a rifle. So uh, we can see that the world had changed a bit since uh, between those two wars. Uh, Portal was a gentleman of the first stripe. Uh, the Americans liked him, respected him, trusted him. Um, and um, he was just the kind of guy somebody said that you would want to serve under. Very, very uh, uh, likable, personable, as well as, as perfectly up to any of the demands of his job. He was 49 years old in command of the RAF. Uh, but all of that said, he too had his uh, sharp side when he wanted it. Uh, Churchill said after the war that although Portal was a great gentleman, he berated me like a pickpocket in front of the American ambassador. So none of these guys were uh, shy, put it that way. Uh, one of the other senior British officers at the table was uh, Lord Lewis Mountbatten, um, who is probably familiar to most of us, uh, partly because of his tragic death in the 1970s at the hands of the IRA. But um, at the time, he was a cousin of the king, uh, a grandson, a great grandson of Queen Victoria, and um, also in his mid 40s, and in command of the British commandos and special units across the services, Navy, Army, and RAF. Churchill made him 
a uh, lieutenant general in the army, uh, an admiral in the Navy, and a senior officer in the RAF, as Churchill put it, to give him a bit of weight. Um, and uh, he, um, apart from all of those credentials and all of those bloodlines, came across surprisingly enough as a very affable, personable character, not only to his fellow senior officers, but to the lowest serving uh, waiter at the table, uh, the secretaries, everybody liked uh, Lord Lewis, as he was called. And um, he uh, later uh, went on to command the British forces in Burma. But at the, at the uh, conference table, he was a significant player. Um, so here, by the way, you get a little sense of Mountbatten's personality. This is a group picture taken at the conference. And Mountbatten had been told jokingly by Roosevelt that maybe he shouldn't be in the picture because he really wasn't one of the three chiefs of the services. But the others said, no, put him in. So you see Mountbatten at the end there kind of shrinking down, trying to look small uh, as the picture is taken, not quite being worthy of uh, being there with the others. So the conference takes place in uh, the outskirts of Casablanca in a very wealthy enclave for uh, rich Moroccans, rich Europeans who had villas and uh, basically a very high-end, you might think of it as a very, very high-end suburb of Casablanca, in the middle of, the, of which was the Anfa Hotel. The suburb was known as Anfa, and the Anfa Hotel had been built in the late 30s in the kind of streamlined modern style of that day. It was a resort hotel, very nicely equipped, well turned out, and uh, all of the officers had their quarters there, the meetings were held there, and um, at the top of the building was the restaurant Panoramique, uh, where the, um, the Americans and the British uh, would both dine. Um, there had been other conferences before this one, one in Washington and two in London, but the difference was that in those situations, whoever had the home court would go back to their offices after the meeting, and the visitors would go back to their hotels, and they just really didn't interact much. At Casablanca, they lived together, they ate together, they drank together, they sat around each other's rooms like college freshmen and got to know each other and became friends, and there were real bonds formed there. Um, in addition to which, you know, the British were living in meager wartime conditions with rationed eggs and, you know, phony milk and all kinds of uh, very scant provisions. Uh, at Casablanca, there was what one officer called an embarrassment of riches, you know, in food, plates of oranges lying about. And, you know, one of them said they were wondering if one could do oneself harm by a surfeit of oranges because uh, they would just gobble those things. So the whole thing was a kind of a genial atmosphere uh, on the off hours and a very businesslike, sometimes difficult, even tense uh, atmosphere when the meetings were taking place. But these personal bonds that were formed there uh, were crucial, both at the conference and later. Uh, here's an aerial view of the uh, hotel. And around it, you can see some of those villas I mentioned, uh, which the Americans commandeered. Patton, uh, George C. Patton had led the uh, amphibious force that took North Africa a few months earlier and had taken the Anfa Hotel as his headquarters. Um, he had also taken the most luxurious villa, uh, finding that suitable for his personal occupation. And uh, the others you see spin around there, sort of at, uh, I don't know, one o'clock is Churchill's villa. And to the right of that down below is FDR's. So they could walk between the two easily. And it was Churchill, of course, who did the walking and would come to FDR rather than the other way around. I found this chart in the papers of one of the junior officers who participated. And you can see again that Anfa Hotel in the center, the villas around it, and the barbed wire in red uh, that encircled it. It was about a mile of barbed wire, fortified barbed wire, anti-aircraft guns all around that, tanks, uh, elite British Marines, elite British troops, uh, American day fighters and British night fighters circling overhead all the time. Uh, so, you know, the security could not have been tighter, but obviously people wondered what was going on. You couldn't miss this. And there was all kinds of crazy speculation about Haile Selassie was there with the Pope and uh, 
the, uh, the uh, King of Italy was on his way to surrender and uh, all kinds of things like that. But nobody came up with the utterly absurd idea that Churchill, FDR, and their high command would be within that barbed wire circle for 10 days within easy range of the German Air Force, but they pulled it off. I'll tell you one quick thing along those lines. Um, there were, Casablanca was crawling with spies. I mean, if, if you remember the movie, it's all about spies, or a lot of it's about spies. And uh, the Germans had their spies, of course, and they also had Spanish spies uh, who were loyal to the Germans in the wake of the uh, Spanish Civil War. And a Spanish spy found out that Churchill and Roosevelt were meeting in that spot and wired that to Berlin on the first day. Some wooden headed German officer translated Casablanca as White House. So the Germans concluded that FDR and Churchill were in Washington. Um, history does not record what became of him, but I would not have been in his, would not have wanted to bend to him in his shoes. Uh, Patton, to speak of the devil, um, was in charge of all of the arrangements because, you know, he was the commanding officer of the, uh, the division that had taken uh, Casablanca, known as the Hell on Wheels division. And, um, you know, we, we would expect, as he did, that Patton would oversee the barbed wire and the tanks and the artillery and all that. But he was also kind of a cruise director. He was in charge of the food and the entertainment and everything else. And he's writing this diary as the whole thing's going on. He's very frustrated with this role that he has. And at, at one point he writes in the diary that, um, you know, this is a very hush-hush conference going on here, which I am not in, thank God. I just want to go out and kill somebody. Uh, that is a shot of FDR's villa at the, uh, at the conference. Um, FDR and Churchill, as I said, I think earlier, did not attend the business meetings of the military high command. They had their own meetings every day. They would meet often for lunch and for dinner, and in between discuss great military issues, political, diplomatic issues, entertain each other, which they love to do. Uh, at one point, uh, FDR had written Churchill a note that said, it's, it's fun to be in the same century with you. Um, so there was a bond there and a friendship there as well as a partnership. Uh, and uh, that was the site of uh, many of those meetings. Today, by the way, uh, it's in private hands, but Churchill's villa is the American legation in uh, Casablanca. This gives you a sense of that little festive atmosphere that sort of underlays some of this. Uh, uh, Roosevelt sitting on the right, his right-hand man, Harry Hopkins, uh, to his right. Across from him is his son, Elliot Roosevelt, who was uh, an American pilot, had won the Distinguished Flying Cross for very dangerous photographic uh, flying over enemy territory. Uh, and at the other end of the table is Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., who was a naval officer, decorated naval officer, who had fought at the Battle of Casablanca and saved the life of uh, one of his seamen and also was highly decorated. So there's two reasons why I show you this. One is this kind of light atmosphere that's there uh, as this conference is going on off camera, but also uh, something that we may never see again, which is the likes of the two sons, and there were two others who also were in combat, uh, actually in combat in this war. Harry Hopkins' son was killed in the war. Uh, Marshall's stepson was killed in the war. Uh, and it was a war in which all classes, all levels of society participated uh, with a unity and a vision in this country that we have rarely seen since. <clears throat> so now a little bit about some of the lesser British players, if you will. Harold Macmillan, I think many of us are old enough to remember Harold Macmillan was the prime minister of Britain himself in the early 60s, uh, overlapping with Charles de Gaulle and John F. Kennedy and, and for a time with Eisenhower. Uh, at, the, at this time though, Mac, uh, Macmillan was a junior British diplomat and uh, assigned to work on unifying the French, which we'll get to uh, briefly. Uh, but at one point, uh, Macmillan's a very witty guy, very entertaining uh, memoir. And um, at one point, he, he, in talking about the Casablanca conference, he says that when you went to FDR's villa at night, a searchlight was thrown upon you and a collection of individuals who resembled 
retired Chicago gangsters drew weapons on you uh, and uh, checked you out until you got through the defenses and then everything was fine. Well, I thought that was a little harsh, you know, Chicago gangsters, until I found a photograph um, of uh, FDR's Secret Service detail. And I think McMillan, McMillan can be forgiven. So here is the conference table at which the uh, military high command met and, uh, and worked their way through this problem. I'll quickly go around the room. At the left from behind is Admiral King, then General Marshall, General Arnold, uh, then a Brigadier General who was the note taker and the minute maker. So, I mean, that's the level of this. A Brigadier General is taking notes and writing the minutes overnight. Next to him is the British Brigadier General who did that for the British, whose name is Vivian Dykes, a very entertaining character who wrote a little poem about the, the minute work, uh, which I'll tell you, it's very brief. Um, but the issue was that they would write these notes at the table, keep track of what everybody was saying throughout these very long days, and then produce the minutes overnight so that in the next morning, they'd come back to that table and all the minutes of what had happened would be sitting in front of them at their chair. So this is a thankless task. Uh, Vivian Dykes wrote a little ditty. And so when the great ones repair to their dinner, the secretary stays getting thinner and thinner, racking his brain to record and report what he thinks they will think they ought to have thought. <laughs> Next to Dykes is a very interesting, colorful character that takes up a lot of pages in the book, uh, General Albert Wedemeyer, an American general of German descent, German speaking, uh, brined in Anglophobia from his infancy, uh, who had written horrible things about the British, uh, both publicly and privately. I had very little regard for them and needless to say, they for him, but there he sits. Uh, to his left is uh, General uh, Pug Ismay, Lionel Ismay, known as Pug, who is Churchill's mili closest military advisor, uh, not a member of the high command, but in a very senior spot with Churchill. Next to him is Mountbatten. Um, and then next to him is Admiral Pound and then Brooke with these owl-like glasses, as you can see. And uh, it's kind of ironic, this ornithologist, and he kind of has this owl-like look. And uh, somebody wrote that he had these bird-like movements as well. And uh, he had this very irritating style, interrupting people, you know, shaking his head before somebody had finished speaking and then opening up like a Gatling gun as one of them said after he stopped. So it was, the, it was not the cheeriest atmosphere in that room. Um, Ismay said there was a veiled atmosphere of distrust and suspicion in the first few days. Um, and then next to uh, Brooke there on his left is Portal, and next to him is uh, General Sir John Dill, actually Field Marshal Sir John Dill, a name that we don't know. I don't think even British people know it by and large, but Dill might have been the most highly respected officer in the British Army and had been posted to Washington as the senior British representative in Washington during the war and had therefore formed a very close bond, close friendship with Marshall and with other American uh, officers and came to this conference then as someone admired and trusted and respected by both sides. And as we'll see in a minute, that was crucial to the outcome of the meeting. Again, human interactions, personalities have a lot to do with outcomes, not only in business or law or medicine or anything else, but also at this level with literally the fate of the world at stake and how these decisions were made. So now back to these maps to tell you about what the basic issues at the conference were. There were a dozen other issues that we don't have time for, but the crucial ones, the centerpieces were two. One is uh, what proportion of our military resources are we gonna devote to the Pacific and what proportion to Europe? Uh, the Americans, needless to say, wanted to go full bore in the Pacific, uh, a very aggressive war against Japan, having gone through the Pearl Harbor experience and the rest. And the American public thought of the Japanese as the prime enemy and as the Germans, okay, we have to fight them too. But it, at that time, you will see from polling and other sociological research that the Americans were much hotter on going against Japan than they were against Germany. So issue one, number one, is how much power 
manpower, ships, aircraft, and the rest are going to go to the Pacific and how much to Europe. The British wanted to fight just a defensive, very low-scale war in the Pacific until Hitler was beaten, and then they would join the Americans to knock Japan out. But uh, that didn't fly with, with the American side, so that's issue one. Uh, issue two in Europe focuses on Europe. Um, the British, well, let me start with the Americans. The Americans believe strongly in crossing the channel as soon as possible and hitting the Germans in the teeth where they were strongest in Northern France and then driving right to Berlin. This is typical American military doctrine at that time, largely learned at the knee of Ulysses S. Grant in the Civil War. You attack the, the most powerful army the enemy has in his most powerful place and you defeat him and you take the casualties and you inflict the casualties and you win that war. So that's the sort of mindset of the Americans. The problem was, it was all but impossible to do that in January of 1943. They didn't have the shipping. The Atlantic was riddled with U-boats that were sinking many of the ships that tried to cross. They didn't have the landing craft. They didn't have the troops. They didn't have the trained troops. And they were fighting the best army the world had ever seen, which was dug in in concrete, barbed wire, and all of that. Anybody who's seen Saving Private Ryan and that opening scene, uh, can imagine what this would be like to attack the Germans in France a year before they actually did when they were simply not ready for it. But that's the position the Americans were pushing. The British were pushing a very different strategy, which is to use that Anglo-American army that's already in North Africa to attack targets in the Mediterranean. And unlike going across the channel into Northern France, where they would hit a bee's nest, um, if you look at that map, Rook described it as fingers coming down into the Mediterranean. And the Germans would have to spread their forces thin throughout that whole region, because they wouldn't know where the Allies were going to hit. They could see them assembling the landing craft and assembling the troops and the rest, but they wouldn't know where they were going. So they'd have to cover it all. They'd have to pull troops from the Russian front, which was going to keep Russia in the war, crucial. Without Russia, no, no victory in World War II. Two thirds of the German army was fighting the Russians uh, at this time. And so the, the, the trick was to try to draw them out of Russia, draw them out of Northern France and defeat them piecemeal in the Mediterranean, open the Mediterranean to allied shipping. And then in the spring of 44, to launch that decisive uh, you know, uh, invasion across the channel. So again, we don't have time to go into it. The book goes into it in, in great depth, but that was the major battle um, at the conference table. Uh, Field Marshal Dill, who I mentioned earlier, um, was working the room, not in the room, but outside the room. He never said a word at the conference table. What he would do after the conference was over was to work on Marshall, circulate with, um, the other American officers, and work on Brooke, who was a very stubborn, obstinate man. Uh, Dill was kind of a mentor to Brooke, so he had a kind of a, you know, a authority, if you will, over Brooke or a, a persuasiveness that Brooke respected. So Dill spent the entire 10 days, as he later put it, putting the young things together, uh, trying to get people to cooperate and see things differently outside the, the conference room. This is a photograph taken at Casablanca that I speak again, I think again speaks volumes. You've got Brooke there with his hands in his pockets, telling, uh, rather uh, Dill on the right, with his hands in his pockets, telling Brooke, now Alan, you know, you're gonna have to give on this point. And then you got Brooke with his hands on his hips, staring back at him and saying, I'm not gonna move an inch. And Dill says, oh yes, you will, you got to. So that was going on uh, while the, uh, or while the uh, conference, uh, dragged on and to very great effect. Kind of the unsung hero of the whole thing is, is a guy that nobody's ever heard of, uh, a British, a very senior British RAF officer named Sir John Coatsworth Slesser. He was a staff officer. He was not at the command level. He was there as staff, uh, but he was a very experienced, savvy, uh, well-trained, guy, and what he would do is sit there and listen to the discussion, watch the faces 
on both sides, who was saying what, who was reacting how, and taking notes and trying to think through how to come up with a compromise that could satisfy everybody, which he eventually did. Uh, at one point when it looked like the meeting was gonna literally break down and the Alliance might actually break down in sense of cooperation, uh, Slusser goes up on the roof of that hotel with his notepad and comes back with a compromise that saved the day. One thing I wanna point out again, these personalities are fascinating to me. If you look carefully, you can see that he's leaning on a cane uh, at the bottom of that photograph. So he's making a point of that, that he's leaning on this cane. Uh, Slesser was a victim of childhood polio, lame in both legs, walked with two canes, and had been a uh, World War I biplane pilot, ace, decorated, uh, polio and all. So that's uh, another testament to how men were men in those days. Uh, and Slesser, um, Slesser really is a hero of the whole operation. So here we have the FDR and Churchill end of it. Uh, this photograph was taken in FDR's dining room at the Moroccan White House. And um, that is where uh, he and Churchill would meet and try to hash things out between them while the military uh, were meeting separately. And here you have them, that is the senior military, uh, arrayed around that dining room table for a photograph either before or after one of three plenary sessions, as they were called where FDR and Churchill and all the military met together at that table in FDR's dining room to hash out where they were going, where the bugs were, where the issues were, and kind of lead them, Churchill and FDR, to places that they wanted them to be going, listening, arguing. And another fascinating part of that is that in these discussions, these three very long, very important uh, debates, if you will, no deference was given to rank or position. You didn't get to win because you were the president or the prime minister or the chief of the imperial general staff. What carried the day was who had the better idea and whether the flaws in the other guy's idea were bigger than the flaws in your idea. And it's really kind of a fascinating thing to read those minutes and put them into the book about how all that happened and how these two legendary political leaders uh, were able to wrangle these huge egos uh, with five stars on their shoulders and get this thing done as they did. Uh, this is just a little vignette I throw in here for entertainment if you don't, if you don't mind. Uh, this is General Ira Eaker, who was the commander of the American Eighth Air Force in England, uh, which uh, was bombing um, German uh, military targets in occupied France and Holland at the time and later led uh, the American Air Force when they attacked Germany. He was the son of a Texas sharecropper, uh, had come from a very impoverished background. And it was he who was selected by his superiors to meet one-on-one -on -one with Winston Churchill and talk him out of a position that Churchill had locked himself in on with regard to bombing strategy. And I'll make it very brief. The British were bombing German cities by night at this time. Uh, unable to take the casualties and the losses that daylight bombing would have caused. So they would fly over German cities at night, drop their bombs, not quite indiscriminately, they drop them in industrial areas, but not with any kind of accuracy. The Americans were doing what they called precision bombing by day. They had a, a new bomb site that was quite accurate. Their planes were designed for that kind of flying. Uh, the flying fortresses had eight to 12 heavy machine guns pointed in all directions to defend them from German fighters. And they would fly in boxes of 20, and there'd be four or six of those boxes. So you can see this overwhelming military power coming at the German targets and fending off the fighters that would attack them. But Churchill tried to convince Eker to abandon that uh, tactic and join the British in night bombing. Eker had prepared a memo that Churchill read before uh, they met. And then they spent a half an hour, he had a half an hour to do this. Texas sharecropper's son confronting Winston Churchill on a crucial point in the outcome of World War II and prevailed. Churchill heard him out, understood his argument and told him, well, young man, you haven't convinced me uh, 
but uh, I'm going to let this go for a while. We'll give it a trial and see how it goes. And what had persuaded him was Eaker told Churchill, you know, the big thing here, sir, is that we'll keep them going during the day. You'll keep them going at night. They'll never get to bed. They'll be wired the whole time. They'll be exhausted. We'll pummel them around the clock. And Churchill looks up with a cigar and nods his head and says, I like it. The devils will get no rest. Uh, and then one quick, uh, one quick follow-up vignette, if you will, again, the American-British uh, contrast. When the American Air Force officers arrived in London, they were given quarters uh, just outside London in what had been a very fancy uh, private girls' school called the Wycliffe, or Wycliffe, I guess, a school for girls. Uh, it had been, of course, cleared of, of the students and was now kind of a dormitory. Uh, for the American officers. And uh, Eker, you know, they all arrive and they take their residence in the dormitory. Eker's in his ground floor office on that first morning and he hears a bell ringing upstairs. And uh, he's wondering what that's all about. And then a few minutes later, he hears another bell uh, ringing and a third and a fourth. So he has to figure out what this is. So he goes upstairs and it turns out that in this British boarding school, this girl's British boarding school, there was a table at every landing with a, a bell, like an old school bell on it, and a sign over it that said, ring bell for mistress. Uh, during the conference, FDR insisted on reviewing American troops. You know, again, top secret, president, prime minister, all these big generals and admirals in one place, nobody wants, wants them to be found out. But Roosevelt insisted on going about half a day's ride up the road to review the American army under General Mark Clark that was assembled for this great invasion that was coming up. It's a photograph of that. Um, the army was assembled thinking Clark was going to review them, had no idea that Roosevelt would be there. And as Roosevelt drove along, as you can see in that, in that photograph, you know, jaws were dropping. At, at one point, he heard some little kid, you know, little kid to me, a little kid, but probably an 18 year old uh, soldier as, as she's going by, just, just says, Jesus. So uh, the, the impact was, uh, was quite amazing, but he was criticized for it at the time by some of the British officers in particular. They thought it was kind of showboating and uh, trying to be a politician. It was really quite the contrary. It was to boost morale, uh, not only of the troops, but also of the home crowd. You know, this became the newsreel footage a week later, was on the front page of every magazine. And uh, when I went to Hyde Park to research the book, I came across uh, letters that, um, uh, well, let me, let me do this first. Here's uh, FDR, Harry Hopkins and Patton dining with these troops out in the field at a field kitchen out of mess kits. Uh, when they were done and the table had been cleared, FDR said to General Clark, he wanted to take his mess kit home as a souvenir. And um, uh, Clark ran in and was told that it had been washed with a thousand others. So he just grabbed the first one he could find and gave it back to the president who said he was gonna put it in the Smithsonian. Uh, here's that letter I was talking about that um, uh, Roosevelt had prepared to send to the families of uh, the, the men he had met who had either protected him or cooked for him or served for him in some way. Uh, and also of the Americans who were buried in the cemetery that had been uh, established there for those victims. And back came letters from all these mothers and wives and sisters and brothers that are really quite moving. I don't have time to go into them, but uh, I can't really recite them without getting emotional anyway. So you have to read about it. Um, coming to the end or toward the end, we've got uh, a dinner that FDR gave for the Sultan of Morocco uh, while uh, he was there. And, um, you know, Morocco was a French protectorate, more or less a colony. And Church, uh, Roosevelt spent the whole time at that dinner telling the Sultan how after the war, his country would be independent. Americans would come in, help him, you know, develop the country. And, you know, Churchill was going uh, apoplectic at hearing all of this. Um, and that in itself makes for an interesting chapter. Uh, there's also a, a, a long piece in the book about five American WACs, as they were called, Women's Auxiliary Corps 
officers who were there as executive secretaries to the president and these high, in the high command, uh, they had been torpedoed on their way to North Africa in the middle of the night in December in Morocco and had been rescued. FDR heard they were there, invited them all to dinner, and uh, I managed to track down the daughter of this woman, Captain Louise Anderson, who had all of her diaries and letters and mementos about that dinner, which is quite an event to, to, to read about as well. Uh, De Gaulle, I don't have time. <laughs> Simple as that, but uh, De Gaulle is a key figure in the book. Uh, nobody was as, uh, Nobody was as uh, impressed with Charles de Gaulle as Charles de Gaulle. Uh, and uh, the stories are endless and I don't have time to tell them, but uh, there he is. Um, that is the other uh, French general off to the right, second from the right, who was a rival of de Gaulle's and FDR and Churchill were doing their best to try to get them to unite and to combine all the French forces in one. Here he is photographed after he was captured by the Germans in 1940. At the age of 64, he later escaped by rappelling down the side of a castle at night with bed sheets tied together and made his way from there back to France. So quite the figure. Uh, and here's the four of them at Casablanca uh, with uh, FDR and Churchill. Uh, again, we don't have time, but FDR essentially snookered de Gaulle into standing up and shaking hands with uh, Giro at this press conference after the thing was over. Basically, he had a report he put a thought in the ear of one of the reporters who yelled out, Mr. President, can we get the two generals shaking hands? And FDR put his hands under their arms and they had no choice but a scene. So they got up and you can see the um, handshake was as far apart as the laws of physics allowed. And finally, the press conference itself that was held after the conference where FDR famously announced the policy of, excuse me, of unconditional surrender that there would be no negotiating with the Nazis or the Jap Japanese or the Italians, that it would be unconditional surrender and we were gonna fight until that was won. And you can see Captain Anderson up in the middle top end of that photograph with her stenograph machine uh, taking those, uh, those minutes, which I got from her daughter. Um, and that's a photograph of her with Churchill. And uh, she wrote underneath that, we're practically buddies by now. Uh, at the end of the whole thing, Marrakesh, uh, Churchill takes FDR down to Marrakesh for a couple of days of R&R, &R, takes him up to the Minaret, this beautiful uh, Moroccan home they stayed at, seeing this lovely view. And then the next day, Churchill brought his easel up there. He's an amateur painter, had painted not at all during the war, but painted a beautiful uh, picture of that scene from the top of the tower, which somehow made it, uh, Churchill gave it to FDR. Uh, who treasured it, but somehow, I don't know how, it made its way into the hands of Brad Pitt, who, went, who in turn gave it to Angelina Jolie, who auctioned it off at Christie's for $11 million. And that's, uh, that's where we end. I appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, James Conroy. Jim, thank you so much. So I have good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is we don't have any more times for questions from the audience, but that Mr. Conroy would be happy to answer questions if you purchase a book. <laughs> so he will be in the back of the room and he's happy to uh, purchase a book. Uh, we have a lot of great programs coming up. The next two programs are sold out. Feel free to put yourself on the waiting list. We'll do our best. We do have an invitation only um, event next Monday, which is our annual celebration. And the invitation is for our donors. So if you'd like to learn how to be a donor and be invited to next Monday's celebration, again, see Gary Dorsheimer, Kristen Moran, or myself. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. And again, please thank James Conroy.